Story five of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Revenge of the Adolphus Parts One through Four One Stand by Shackles had come down from the bridge of the Adolphus and flung this command at three fellow correspondents who in the galley were busy with pencils trying to write something exciting and interesting from four days' quiet cruising. They looked up casually. What for? They did not intend to arouse for nothing. Ever since Shackles had heard the men of the Navy directing each other to stand by for this thing and that thing, he had used the two words as his pet phrase, and was continually telling his friends to stand by. Sometimes its portentous and emphatic reiteration became highly exasperating, and men were apt to retort sharply, "'Well, I am standing by, ain't I?' On this occasion they detected that he was serious. "'Well, what for?' they repeated. In his answer Shackles was reproachful as well as impressive. "'Stand by? Stand by for a Spanish gunboat. A Spanish gunboat in chase. Stand by for two Spanish gunboats, both of them in chase." The others looked at him for a brief space and were almost certain that they saw truth written upon his countenance. Whereupon they tumbled out of the galley and galloped up to the bridge. The cook, with a mere inkling of tragedy, was now out on deck bawling, "'What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter?' Aft, the grimy head of a stoker was thrust suddenly up through the deck, so to speak. The eyes flashed in a quick look astern, and then the head vanished. The correspondents were scrambling on the bridge. Where's my glasses, damn it? Here, let me take a look. Are they Spaniards, Captain? Are you sure? The skipper of the Adolphus was at the wheel. The pilot-house was so arranged that he could not see astern without hanging forth from one of the side windows, but apparently he had made early investigation. He did not reply at once. At sea he never replied at once to questions. At the very first Shackles had discovered the merits of this deliberate manner, and had taken delight in it. He invariably detailed his talk with the captain to the other correspondents. "'Look here, I've just been to see the skipper. I said I would like to put up into Cape Haitian. Then he took a little think. Finally he said, "'All right.' Then I said, "'I suppose we'll need to take on more coal there?' He took another little think. I said, "'Ever ran into that port before?' He took another little think. Finally he said, Yes. I said, Have a cigar? He took another little think. See, that's where I fooled them. While the correspondents spun the hurried questions at him, the captain of the Adolphus stood with his brown hands on the wheel and his cold glance aligned straight over the bow of his ship. Are they Spanish gunboats, Captain? Are they, Captain? After a profound pause he said, Yes. The four correspondents hastily, and in perfect time, presented their backs to him and fastened their gaze on the pursuing foe. They saw a dull grey curve of sea going to the feet of the high green and blue coastline of northeastern Cuba, and on this sea were two miniature ships with clouds of iron-coloured smoke pouring from their funnels. One of the correspondents strolled elaborately to the pilot-house, Ah, Captain, he drawled, do you think they can catch us? The captain's glance was still aligned over the bow of his ship. Ultimately, he answered, I don't know. From the top of the little Adolphus stack, thick, dark smoke swept level for a few yards, and then went rolling to leeward in great, hot, obscuring clouds. From time to time the grimy head was thrust through the deck, the eyes took the quick look astern, and then the head vanished. The cook was trying to get somebody to listen to him. "'Well, you know, damn it all, it won't be no fun to be catched by them Spaniards. By God, it won't. Look here, what do you think they'll do to us, eh? 
Say, I don't like this, you know. I'm damned if I do. The sea, cut by the hurried bow of the Adolphus, flung its waters astern in the formation of a wide angle, and the lines of the angle ruffled and hissed as they fled, while the thumping screw tormented the water at the stern. The frame of the steamer underwent regular convulsions as in the strenuous sobbing of a child. The mate was standing near the pilot-house. Without looking at him, the captain spoke his name. Ed? Yes, sir, cried the mate with alacrity. The captain reflected for a moment. Then he said, Are they gaining on us? The mate took another anxious survey of the race. No, yes, I think they are, a little. After a pause, the captain said, Tell the chief to shake her up more. The mate, glad of an occupation in these tense minutes, flew down to the engine-room door. "'Skipper says shake her up more,' he bawled. The head of the chief engineer appeared, a grisly head, now wet with oil and sweat. "'What?' he shouted angrily. It was as if he had been propelling the ship with his own arms. Now he was told that his best was not good enough. "'What? Shake her up more?' "'Why, she can't carry another pound, I tell you, not another ounce. We—' Suddenly he ran forward and climbed to the bridge. "'Captain,' he cried in the loud, harsh voice of one who lived usually amid the thunder of machinery, "'she can't do it, sir. By God, she can't. She's turning over now faster than she ever did in her life, and will all blow to hell.' The low-toned, impassive voice of the captain suddenly checked the chief's clamor. "'I'll blow her up he said, but I won't get catched if I can help it. Even then the listening correspondents found a second in which to marvel that the captain had actually explained his point of view to another human being. The engineer stood blank. Then suddenly he cried, All right, sir. He threw a hurried look of despair at the correspondents, the deck of the Adolphus, the pursuing enemy, Cuba, the sky, and the sea he vanished in the direction of his post. A correspondent was suddenly regifted with the power of prolonged speech. "'Well, you see, the game is up, damn it. See? We can't get out of it. The skipper will blow up the whole bunch before he'll let his ship be taken, and the Spaniards are gaining. Well, that's what comes from going to war in an eight-knot tub.' He bitterly accused himself, the others, and the dark, sightless, indifferent world. This certainty of coming evil affected each one differently. One was made garrulous. One kept absent-mindedly snapping his fingers and gazing at the sea. Another stepped nervously to and fro, looking everywhere, as if for employment for his mind. As for shackles, he was silent and smiling, but it was a new smile that caused the lines about his mouth to betray quivering weakness and each man looked at the others to discover their degree of fear, and did his best to conceal his own, holding his crackling nerves with all his strength. As the Adolphus rushed on, the sun suddenly emerged from behind grey clouds, and its rays dealt titanic blows so that in a few minutes the sea was a glowing blue plain with the golden shine dancing at the tips of the waves. The coast of Cuba glowed with light. The pursuers displayed detail after detail in the new atmosphere. The voice of the cook was heard in high vexation. Am I to get dinner as usual? How do I know? Nobody tells me what to do. Am I to get dinner as usual? The mate answered ferociously, Of course you are. What do you suppose? Ain't you the cook, you damn fool? The cook retorted in a mutinous scream. Well, how would I know? If this ship is a-going to blow up... 2. The captain called from the pilot-house, Mr. Shackles! Oh, Mr. Shackles! The correspondent moved hastily to a window. What is a captain? The skipper of the Adolphus raised a battered finger and pointed over the bows. See here? he asked, laconic but quietly jubilant. Another steamer was smoking at full speed over the sunlit seas. A great billow of pure white was on her bows. "'Great Scott!' cried Shackles. "'Another Spaniard!' 
"No," said the captain. "That there is a United States cruiser." "What?" Shackles was dumfounded into muscular paralysis. "No! Are you sure?" The captain nodded. "Sure. Take the glass. See her ensign? Two funnels, two masts with fighting tops. She ought to be the _Chancellorville_." Shackles choked. "Well, I'm blowed!" "Ed," said the captain. "Yes, sir." "Tell the chief there is no hurry." Shackles suddenly bethought him of his companions. He dashed to them and was full of quick scorn of their gloomy faces. "Eh, hey, brace up there! Are you blind? Can't you see her?" "See what?" "Why, the Chancellorville, you blind mice!" roared Shackles. "See her? See her? See her?" The others sprang, saw, and collapsed. Shackles was a madman for the purpose of distributing the news. "Cook!" he shrieked. "Don't you see her, Cook?" "'Good God, man, don't you see her?' He ran to the lower deck and howled his information everywhere. Suddenly the whole ship smiled. Men clapped each other on the shoulder and joyously shouted. The captain thrust his head from the pilot-house to look back at the Spanish ships. Then he looked at the American cruiser. "'Now we'll see,' he said grimly and vindictively to the mate. "'Guess somebody else will do some running.' The mate chuckled. The two gunboats were still headed hard for the Adolphus, and she kept on her way. The American cruiser was coming swiftly. "'It's the Chancellorville!' cried Shackles. "'I know her. We'll see a fight at sea, my boys, a fight at sea!' The enthusiastic correspondents pranced in Indian revels. The Chancellorville, two thousand tons, eighteen point six knots, ten five-inch guns, came on tempestuously shearing the water high with her sharp bow. From her funnels the smoke raced away in driven sheets. She loomed with extraordinary rapidity like a ship bulging and growing out of the sea. She swept by the Adolphus so close that one could have thrown a walnut on board. She was a glistening gray apparition with a blood-red water-line, with brown gun-muzzles and white-clothed motionless jack-tars, and in her rush she was silent, deadly silent. Probably there entered the mind of every man on board the Adolphus a feeling of almost idolatry for this living thing, stern but to their thought incomparably beautiful. They would have cheered, but that each man seemed to feel that a cheer would be too puny a tribute. It was at first as if she did not see the Adolphus. She was going to pass without heeding this little vagabond of the high seas. But suddenly a megaphone gaped over the rail of her bridge, and a voice was heard measuredly, calmly, intoning, "'Hello there! Keep well to the northard and out of my way!' and I'll go in and see what those people want." Then nothing was heard but the swirl of water. In a moment the Adolphus was looking at a high gray stern. On the quarter-deck sailors were poised about the breech of the after-pivot gun. The correspondents were reveling. "'Captain!' yelled Shackles. "'We can't miss this. We must see it.' But the skipper had already flung over the wheel. Sure, he answered almost at once, we can't miss it. The cook was arrogantly, grossly triumphant. His voice rang along the deck. There now, how will the spinachers like that? Now it's our turn. We've been doing the running away, but now we'll do the chasin'. Apparently feeling some twinge of nerves from the former strain, he suddenly demanded, Say, who's got any whiskey? I'm near dead for a drink. When the Adolphus came about, she laid her course for a position to the northward of a coming battle, but the situation suddenly became complicated. When the Spanish ships discovered the identity of the ship that was steaming toward them, they did not hesitate over their plan of action. With one accord they turned and ran for port. Laughter arose from the Adolphus. The captain broke his orders, and instead of keeping to the northward, he headed in the wake of the impetuous Chancellorville. The correspondents crowded on the bow. 
The Spaniards, when their broadsides became visible, were seen to be ships of no importance, mere little gunboats, for work in the shallows back of the reefs, and it was certainly discreet to refuse encounter with the five-inch guns of the Chancellorville. But the joyful Adolphus took no account of this discretion. The pursuit of the Spaniards had been so ferocious that the quick change to heels-overhead flight filled that corner of the mind which is devoted to the spirit of revenge. It was this that moved Shackles to yell taunts futilely at the faraway ships. "'Well, how do you like it, huh? How do you like it?' The Adolphus was drinking compensation for her previous agony. The mountains of the shore now shadowed high into the sky, and the square white houses of a town could be seen near a vague cleft which seemed to mark the entrance to a port. The gunboats were now near to it. Suddenly white smoke streamed from the bow of the Chancellorville and developed swiftly into a great bulb which drifted in fragments down the wind. Presently the deep-throated boom of the gun came to the ears on board the Adolphus. The shot kicked up a high jet of water into the air astern of the last gunboat. The black smoke from the funnels of the cruiser made her look like a collier on fire, and in her desperation she tried many more long shots, but presently the Adolphus, murmuring disappointment, saw the Chancellorville sheer from the chase. In time they came up with her, and she was an indignant ship. Gloom and wrath was on the forecastle, and wrath and gloom was on the quarter-deck. A sad voice from the bridge said, "'Just missed em. Shackles gained permission to board the cruiser, and in the cabin he talked to Lieutenant Commander Surrey, tall, bald-headed, and angry. "'Shoals,' said the captain of the Chancellorville, "'I can't go any nearer, and those gunboats could steam along a stone sidewalk, if only it was wet.' Then his bright eyes became brighter. "'I'll tell you what. The Chicken, the Holy Moses, and the Mongolian are on station off Nuevitas. If you will do me a favor, why, to-morrow I will give those people a game.' Three. The Chancellorville lay all night watching off the port of the two gunboats, and soon after daylight the lookout descried three smokes to the westward, and they were later made out to be the Chicken, the Holy Moses, and the Adolphus, the latter tagging hurriedly after the United States vessels. The Chicken had been a harbor tug, but she was now the USS Chicken, by your leave. She carried a six-pounder forward and a six-pounder aft, and her main point was her conspicuous vulnerability. The Holy Moses had been the private yacht of a Philadelphia millionaire. She carried six six-pounders, and her main point was the chaste beauty of the officers' quarters. On the bridge of the Chancellorville, Lieutenant Commander Surrey surveyed his squadron with considerable satisfaction. Presently he signaled to the lieutenant, who commanded the Holy Moses, and to the boatswain, who commanded the chicken, to come aboard the flagship. This was all very well for the captain of the yacht, but it was not so easy for the captain of the tugboat, who had two heavy lifeboats swung fifteen feet above the water. He had been accustomed to talking with senior officers from his own pilot-house through the intercession of the blessed megaphone. However, he got a lifeboat overside, and was pulled to the Chancellorville by three men, which cut his crew almost into halves. In the cabin of the Chancellorville, Surrey disclosed to his two captains his desires concerning the Spanish gunboats, and they were glad for being ordered down from the Nuevite station, where life was very dull. He also announced that there was a shore battery containing, he believed, four field guns, three point twos. His draft, he spoke of it as his draft, would enable him to go in close enough to engage the battery at moderate range, but he pointed out that the main parts of the attempt to destroy the Spanish gunboats must be left to the Holy Moses and the Chicken. His business, he thought, could only be to keep the air so singing about the ears of the battery that the men at the guns would be unable to take an interest in the dash of the smaller American craft into the bay. The officers spoke in their turns. The captain of the chicken announced that he saw no difficulties. 
The squadron would follow the senior officer in line ahead, the S.O. would engage the batteries as soon as possible, she would turn to starboard when the depth of water forced her to do so, and the _Holy Moses_ and the _Chicken_ would run past her into the bay and fight the Spanish ships wherever they were to be found. The captain of the _Holy Moses_, after some moments of dignified thought, said that he had no suggestions to make that would better this plan. Surrey pressed an electric bell. A marine orderly appeared. He was sent with a message. The message brought the navigating officer of the Chancellorville to the cabin, and the four men nosed over a chart. In the end, Surrey declared that he had made up his mind, and the juniors remained in expectant silence for three minutes while he stared at the bulkhead. Then he said that the plan of the chicken's captain seemed to him correct in the main. He would make one change. It was that he should first steam in and engage the battery, and the other vessels should remain in their present positions until he signaled them to run into the bay. If the squadron steamed ahead in line, the battery could, if it chose, divide its fire between the cruiser and the gunboats, constituting the more important attack. He had no doubt, he said, that he could soon silence the battery by tumbling the earthworks on to the guns and driving away the men, even if he did not succeed in hitting the pieces. Of course, he had no doubt of being able to silence the battery in twenty minutes. Then he would signal for the Holy Moses and the Chicken to make their rush, and of course he would support them with his fire as much as conditions enabled him. He arose then, indicating that the conference was at an end. In the few moments more that all four men remained in the cabin, the talk changed its character completely. It was now unofficial, and the sharp badinage concealed furtive affections, academy friendships, the feelings of old-time shipmates, hiding everything under a veil of jokes. "'Well, good luck to you, old boy. Don't get that valuable packet of yours sunk under you.' think how it would weaken the navy. Would you mind buying me three pairs of pajamas in the town yonder? If your engines get disabled, tote her under your arm. You can do it. Good-bye, old man. Don't forget to come out all right. When the captains of the Holy Moses and the Chicken emerged from the cabin, they strode the deck with a new step. They were proud men. The marine on duty above their boats looked at them curiously and with awe. He detected something which meant action, conflict. The boat's crews saw it also. As they pulled their steady stroke, they studied fleetingly the face of the officer in the stern sheets. In both cases they perceived a glad man, and yet a man filled with a profound consideration of the future. 4. A bird-like whistle stirred the decks of the Chancellorville. It was followed by the hoarse bellowing of the boatswain's mate. As the cruiser turned her bow toward the shore, she happened to steam near the Adolphus. The usual calm voice hailed the dispatch boat. Keep that gauze undershirt of yours well out of the line of fire. Aye, aye, sir. The cruiser then moved slowly toward the shore watched by every eye in the smaller American vessels. She was deliberate and steady, and this was reasonable, even to the impatience of the other craft, because the wooded shore was likely to suddenly develop new factors. Slowly she swung to starboard, smoke belched over her, and the roar of a gun came along the water. The battery was indicated by a long, thin streak of yellow earth. The first shot went high, ploughing the chaparral on the hillside. The Chancellorville wore an air for a moment of being deep in meditation. She flung another shell, which landed squarely on the earthwork, making a great dun cloud. Before the smoke had settled, there was a crimson flash from the battery. To the watchers at sea, it was smaller than a needle. The shot made a geyser of crystal water four hundred yards from the Chancellorville. The cruiser, having made up her mind, suddenly went at the battery, hammer, and tongs. She moved to and fro casually, but the thunder of her guns was gruff and angry. Sometimes she was quite hidden in her own smoke, 
but with exceeding regularity the earth of the battery spurted into the air. The Spanish shells, for the most part, went high and wide of the cruiser, jetting the water far away. Once a Spanish gunner took a festive sideshow chance at the waiting group of the three nondescripts. It went like a flash over the Adolphus, singing a wistful metallic note. Whereupon the Adolphus broke hurriedly for the open sea, and men on the Holy Moses and the Chicken laughed hoarsely and cruelly. The correspondents had been standing excitedly on top of the pilot-house, but at the passing of the shell they promptly eliminated themselves by dropping with a thud to the deck below. The cook again was giving tongue. "'Oh, say, this won't do. I'm damned if it will. We ain't no armored cruiser, you know. If one of them shells hits us, well, we finish right there. Tain't like as if it was our business fooling around within the range of them guns. There's no sense in it. Them other fellows don't seem to mind it, but it's their business. If it's your business, you go ahead and you do it. But if it ain't you, look at that, would you?' The Chancellorville had sent up a spread of flags, and the Holy Moses and the Chicken were steaming in. End of Section 7